Okay. On Friday, we talked about. Um, uh, no, we talked about the electrons in an atom, and we talked about them starting out at the, their ground state, n equals one, and then we're adding energy. Energy was absorbed by the atom, and that raised the at, at uh, electron. I'm sorry. The electron started at n equal uh, one. We added energy. It raised the electron to n equals some place that wasn't one, but it was very unstable at a higher energy level. So the electron fell back down to its uh, ground state, and when it fell back down, it ejected a photon. This photon is a packet of light. It's the only way the energy could be conserved. You put it in, it came out, it conserves as a photon that has a specific color. The color um, can be used to form a line spectra. Every atom has its own characteristic lines and colors. And that's like the fingerprint of an atom. Now, um, that had to do with Einstein and Planck. And um, after him came Niels Bohr. And what he did was he figured out that spectra meant something. And he decided that the reason why energy was quantitized or in um, multiples of a, a definite uh, amount of energy was because the electrons must be stuck in an orbit around the nucleus. So if this was the nucleus, he hypothesized that there were these levels, energy levels, he called them shells, and he said maybe it's because the electrons have their place where they can be and they're stuck there. They can jump from level to level. And there's energy involved in moving up and down levels, but they can't be here, for instance. And that part turned out to be exactly true. The rest of the model wasn't very useful, and we've uh, really gotten rid of it. But the fact that electrons exist only in energy levels is true. And we've gone on to describe these energy levels by using quantum numbers, and we'll talk about that in a little while. And that energy is involved in moving an electron from one level to another. About the same uh, time as people were thinking about the movement of the electrons, uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle was um, talked about. Mr. Heisenberg said that it is impossible to know um, the momentum of an electron and its position in space at the same time. And he figured this out because um, if you test one variable, it changes the other. So what the bottom line is, you cannot know the momentum at the same time you know where the electron is. You can either know where it is or you can know its momentum. That's a big deal, but we don't have to get into it any more than that. Okay, what we're now using to describe the electrons and its movement in an atom is called the quantum mechanical model. And it's a mathematical model, um, model that incorporates, of course, the wave and particle characteristic of the electrons. It arises from the work of Mr. Schrodinger, which describes wave functions. These wave functions have the um, variable psi, and it is nothing but a mathematical co computation that talks about where you can find an electron. And it talks about um, the energy of the place where you can find it and the shape of the cloud where you can find the electron. So the wave function tells you the amount of energy and what the space looks like. This wave function gave rise to a term we call an orbital. And an orbital is the calculated probability of finding an electron in, an energy, uh, in a given energy in a region of space. Another way to um, think of an orbital is to talk about the electron density. The electron density means 
what are the odds of finding the electron there? If it has a high density, the odds of finding the electron in that spot is, is very good. If it has a low density, not so much. So when we solve for the wave function, a number of different orbital shapes came into um, play. So the first orbital um, that we're going to talk about is an s orbital. The electron density or the probability of finding an, um, a, a high probability of finding an electron for an s orbital makes a sphere-like shape around the nucleus. Another orbital was shaped like two lobes. We call that a p orbital, and it turns out there were three different ways that these lobes aligned themselves. So there's three p orbitals. One was along the x-axis, one was along the y-axis, and one was along the z-axis. So it was a three-dimensional shape. And the uh, lobes meant that where it was uh, the outer part of the dumbbell that had a high probability of finding the electrons were right here was a very low probability of the electrons being at any time. The next shape that presented itself, the next probability, was the d orbitals. There were four orbitals with um, four lobes each and then a fifth orbital that had a bizarro rama um, shape. So a d, or, a d orbital had five places with high electron uh, density. So we say it has five orbitals. And finally, they found the f orbitals, which were highly complex shapes. There are seven f orbitals. So when we recap this, there was the S shape, which had one orbital, one place of electron density. There were the P orbital, the P shape, which have three orbitals or three high probable um, lobes. There were D that's composed of five orbitals. And F that has seven orbitals. All right. It turns out that this describes the energy of the orbitals. That S is the lowest energy, then P had more energy, D had more energy, and F had the most energy. That kind of makes sense. So now we're talking about um, two things. We're talking about energy levels, and we're talking about orbitals. Now you know um, that chemists are confusing folks all the time. An energy level is also called a shell. An orbital is also called a subshell. An energy level tells you the position of an orbital in relation to the nucleus. It uses the abbreviation N. As N increases, the distance from the nucleus increases, the farther away it is from the nucleus, and thus the energy associated with it increases too. The farther the shell away from the nucleus, the more energy it has. Okay, if I were going to draw this in my little head, this is what makes sense to me. I have a nucleus, and the first energy level, the first shell 
contains only one type of subshell, and that's called S. So N equals 1 for the first energy level. The second energy level has an S orbital. Notice it's bigger because it's farther away from the nucleus. It has an S. This is N equals 2, the second shell. It also has those three P orbitals. So here you can see the shell and its subshell, um, the second shell and its um, subshells. And then it gets more complex and I can't draw those uh, D orbitals anyway, so we'll stop there. Each one of these orbitals can house a, a couple of electrons. Each orbital can house two electrons. So the S orbital has one orbital. Each orbital can put two electrons in it, so S can hold two electrons. The P has three orbitals, so it can hold Electron. The D has five orbitals, so it can hold. And F has seven, so it can hold 14 electrons. Why do we care? Because the electrons are involved in um, bonding and a lot of the energy of the atom. <coughs> Excuse me. So, we're looking at where electrons can be found. Now there are a couple of um, things that we, vocab words that I want to talk about. When I say that an orbital is degenerate, that means it has the same energy as <coughs> sorry, other orbitals. So let's talk about some P orbitals. How many orbitals does P have? Three. three. That means all the P orbitals, remember there are three of them, and I will use a line to um, denote each orbital. That means this one has the same energy associated with this one, has the same energy associated with this one. Okay, they're equal. The lowest energy state is called the ground state. When an, en when an atom absorbs energy, the electrons move to a higher energy level that is excited. <coughs> Can it stay there? No. No. It falls down. Is everybody looking at my baby Coke? <laughs> Isn't it cute? Okay. Now, I think I'm going to remember this. The electron configuration is a method of um, putting electrons in from a multi-electron atom so that they behave in a manner consistent to what we found. And what we found is that um, the electrons put them are put into the lowest energy level first. So if you were talking about boron that has five electrons, this is the electron configuration scheme. Um, these are the energy levels. Here's the first energy level, the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and then seventh, and it would continue on. The first energy level is the one that's used by the first of um, any atom's electrons. And then if you need more room for electrons, they go to um, shells that are further and further away from the nucleus. And when we're talking about the subshells, you fill up the lower energy subshell before you fill up the higher energy subshell. So, um, let's now look at a way of placing electrons, and we'll look at 
this. This is a schematic of uh, an electron configuration when we are using when we are using uh, all the principles that we have found matter when we're placing electrons. The first principle that we have discovered is electrons are built up from the lowest energy level and the lowest sub-energy level to the highest. So the first energy level just has that single s orbital that holds how many electrons? So the first two electrons of any atom will be housed there. Then energy level two will be used because it's a higher energy. It will fill the s orbitals, then the p. Once that's full, you'll go up to the third energy level and so on and so forth. Now, Hun's rule states that electrons will spread as far apart as possible at each sublevel. A sublevel uh, is another word for subshell or orbital. Um, will spread as far apart as possible before pairing. So if I had filled up this energy level and this one, and I had three more electrons to fill, each one would house in its own orbital so they wouldn't repel each other. It wasn't until they had to share that they would share. And the Pauli exclusion principle says that no two electrons can be in the same energy level on the same sublevel in the same orbital with the same spin at the same time. What that means is this orbital cannot hold two electrons spinning in the same direction they would repel each other. If they spin in opposite directions, they're okay to hang together. So they do s spin in opposite directions, and we uh, denote that by an arrow facing up and an arrow facing down. Now, a couple more things that this chart is going to show you. Okay. Um, here are the energy levels. Here are the subshells or um, sub-levels for each one of those energy levels. It is possible for you to quickly calculate the number of electrons that will um, occupy every energy level by doing this simple math. Take the energy level, square it, and multiply by two. So the third energy level 3 squared is 9 times 2 will hold 18 electrons. The fifth energy level will hold 50. Make sure you do your order of operation or this won't work for you. Now we talked about each spin is a plus or a minus, which means they're opposite. N is energy level. So when we're talking about um, assigning electrons a space, we're using this kind of configuration. Another way to do it, instead of having to memorize this, is to use the periodic table. And the periodic table is set up so it gives you a clue how the orbitals are filled. So this is your periodic table in this shaded part here, and this one over here is the S block. And the number, the principal quanta, the energy level that goes with S starts at 1. So 1S. One this light part is the P block. The first number when you use P is 2P. This is the D block. The first time you use the D is with the third energy level. And F starts with 4. All right. So I'm going to um, leave this for you, and then I'm going to use one that's highly colored, and we do ours. Remember this? Yep, this is nice and easy.
kids, some kids really didn't like it last year, but here we go. We're going to use a periodic table to help us write the electron configuration. The electron configuration tells us where all the electrons in a multi-electron atom belong. Let's say that we're talking about fluorine. A neutral atom of fluorine has how many electrons? One. Nine. Okay. <laughs> now, starting with the, using the periodic table and putting one electron in each of the tiles. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Hey, does that work like that all the time? No. Uh huh. It does. It does. Okay. So, let's see what we have. We can see that we start with 1s, and we fill it up with how many electrons? Two. Two. One, two. Now, we move on to the 2s, and how many fit in it? Two. Two. One here and one here. Okay. Now we move across and we're ready for the 2p. And how many electrons will we need to place? Five. One, two, three, four, five is correct. So let's diagnose what we have here in this electron configuration. These numbers correspond to the energy level. The letters, which is the same as the shell, uh, the letters correspond to the orbital, which is the same as the subshell, and the number, sub, or superscript, tells us the number of electrons. So, when we look at this, we can talk intelligently about the electrons. What is the highest energy level electrons can be in? Highest energy level that electrons can be in? 2. The highest energy level is 2. If this was the nucleus, this would be the first energy level, and this would be, I'm not drawing the circle because it takes too much room. This would be the second energy level. The first energy level has an S subshell. The second energy level has an S, and then it has those P's, right? Mm -hmm. So we've put two electrons in the S, 1s, 2 electrons in the 2s, and then we filled up, okay, now are you good? Yeah. Okay. What is the highest energy subshell an electron of fluorine occupies? P. P is correct. P is correct. Okay, let's go and try nickel. Nickel has how many electrons? 28. Okay, we're going to house these electrons from low energy to high energy. So I'm going to write all of the um, energy level and subshells that I have. I have 1s2. 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d1234567 total electrons are there? 
That is correct. Which energy level is furthest away from the nucleus? Four is correct. Oh, isn't that a tricky question? Yeah. This is farthest away from, which is the highest energy level? Four. Energy level is the number. Energy level is the number. The orbital is the letter. Yep, yes, that is an excellent question. This is the convention I use. This is the this is called the filling order. Um, and I'll talk about it in, in one minute why there's a weird filling order. Some people do it in terms of the energy level, and it is proper. to write it in terms uh, from lowest to highest energy. And this would be equally correct. Okay. Okay. Um, I think the majority of books use it this way, um, but this is absolutely acceptable as long as you fill in the correct order. Okay. All right, now let's talk about filling order. The energy step-ups get really close and squished together. Um, we lost a little uh, in, in copying, sorry. So there's a big leap between 1s and 2s. You see that's a big energy leap. Yeah. And then this is smaller, and there's a smaller leap between uh, 2 and 3. Here's 3p, and then the energy kind of squashes together. It turns out the 4s is, a, is um, lower in energy than the 3d is. The 4 energy level is still higher in energy than any th uh, than the 3, but the way they fill is just like this. It does that. These are almost equivalent. It's been found that this is the way that they um, fill. Even though the 4s is farther away from the nucleus, the 4 is farther away from the nucleus, the 4s has less energy than the 3d. Okay. So in this case, the s and d um, difference in energy makes a difference in the way they fill. So why, is that, why does it have less energy? Did you just not use it as efficient or something? Uh, it, it's the way of uh, the shape and something called penetration. So you'll have to remember, and the way you do remember, is off of the periodic table reminds you that it fills oddly, so it tells you how to fill it. Now at some point, you're going to have to use this F block. We're not going to use it because it turns out that there are a lot of inconsistencies, so it's um, not really useful. But if we went here, we would go for 6S then this would be 5D, 4F, actually it goes 6F, I'm sorry, 6S, 4F, 5D, 6P. Why, okay. is, why is D always one less? Why one is D yeah. always one less? Um, because the first two energy levels don't have a D orbital associated with it. So the first time you see it is yeah. Okay. Now, there's another way to visualize the electrons in an atom, and it's called the orbital filling notation. I bet you'll remember this. Uh, because it's really elemental. Um, let's take, I'm going to cross this out, let's take nickel again. What we do with an orbital filling diagram is actually draw a line to, to represent a orbital. S has one, so now we would have 2P, it has three, right, because P is three orbitals. And then we'd go to 3S, 
3P, 4S, 3D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we actually put the arrows in, remember Hans rule, and we could fill electrons this way. Yeah, and you're right, it is really annoying. Yeah. Okay, but it does um, prove a point. I want to talk about paramagnetic and diamagnetic. An atom that is uh, paramagnetic has one or more unpaired electrons. Nickel is paramagnetic because of these two electrons are alone. They both have positive spins. If we were talking about carbon, that would be 1s, 2s. It would be para or di? Para. Mm -hmm. It'd be para. Um, what would this be? These are unpaired, so it's still paramagnetic. What would this be? Dimagnetic. What atom is this? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Neon. Neon. Okay. Now, how many people would like never to do this again? Okay, for the most part, uh, orbital filling notation is for babies. You are not babies. Um, how many people?